All right. Well, thanks all, everybody, so much for coming, especially to uh, Brian and Sean and Don, who's joining us via Skype, my external committee member, a physics professor at Austin College. Um, and so we've got a little technology going on. The previous slide said a fractal topology of time. So we're just going to kind of start with those words and, and see what we're, what we're saying there. Um, and so uh, what I've done in this dissertation, I've based it off of uh, three main thinkers. Uh, Roger Penrose is a physicist who has a, a, quant a theory of quantum consciousness, how quantum processes facilitate consciousness in the brain. Laurent Notal is a French astrophysicist who has a theory of fractal space-time. Um, and so I'm kind of using him as the um, physical basis to say, okay, this is, you know, one way that this could actually be physically possible. Um, and obviously, because he's saying that space-time becomes fractal at the quantum level, this is where it intersects with Roger Penrose's theory of quantum consciousness. And so I, I am then taking, and the third thinker is uh, Susie Vrobel, who's a, a German thinker and who's developed a, a model of fractal time, specifically taking the fractal model and interfacing it with how we experience time, our subjective experience of time. Um, and so, so I take the, the physical of Notal and then Penrose <coughs> connects it to physical consciousness processes and Vrobel connects the physical fractal processes to fractal processes of our subjective experience of time. So I'm kind of weaving three things together here. Uh, and so what I'm looking at is saying that our subjective time is fractal. Well, first of all, we're talking about topology here. And so one way to get your mind around that word is to think about a topographic map. Um, the map is going to map the distance between two points most of the time. Unless it's a topographic map, then you're going to have you know, the elevations on there as well. And so the distance isn't going to really be this distance. It's going to involve, it's going to be a much longer distance if you have to walk over mountains, right? Um, and so the idea with the topology of time is that our subjective experience of time doesn't go like this. We experience time as going slower, you know, like there might be uphill portions of our lives where things are boring or, you know, hard to slog through. And there might be downhill portions of our lives where time is just going at a real good clip. And that this is very unpredictable. There are several variables that contribute to what our subjective experience of time is, um, but the way they interact is, is unpredictable. We can't tell, you know, what's going what's to come next, basically. Um, and so I'm saying there's a, a fractal path. So a fractal path, well, let's see, let me make sure I got through here, and then we'll move on to the next slide. So this line has a topological dimension of one, as does this line. Um, the difference here is that this line has a fractal dimension as well. Because it's jagged, it's taking up some of this next dimension. And so it has something of a, a thickness to it, even though it's not... A, uh, it doesn't have an interior area. Imagining it's really a line rather than a line of thickness. Um, and so a fractal dimension is expressed as just a whole number with a you know decimal point or a fraction afterwards. And so this decimal point expresses how much of that second dimension that line takes up. Um, and so if you're familiar with the Mandelbrot set, which we'll see later, that has a fractal dimension of two. Um, because it is a space-filling curve. There's no place in this plane that doesn't have a piece of the set in it. It's, uh, so it's a space-filling curve, and it has a full, the full two dimensions, but it's a, it's a line that takes up these dimensions instead of a plane taking up these dimensions. Okay, so they're both, this one's linear, and so it's, it's going to proceed at regular intervals, like our clock time. This is our objective clock time. This is our subjective experience. Uh, okay, good. Okay, so Notal, one of his things about uh, fractals is that they are non-differentiable. And so let's define that word and get our minds around what it means. Um, so when you take a, de a derivative of a line, you're taking the slope, which is just the rise over the run. Okay? 
it doesn't have a slope at this point zero. So here it's non-differentiable. It's not predictable where it's going to go next because this is the point where it changes direction. Okay? And so a fractal line is continuous everywhere. If the line, you know, never breaks, well, you can't have breaking fractals also, but in this example, the, the Weierstrass function, um, it's continuous everywhere, but it's differentiable nowhere. And so it looks like this at the macroscopic scale, but when you zoom in on a point, you see that same pattern repeated again. You could never, if you try to find a, a, a straight piece of the line, and you zoom in on that line, you're always going to find jaggedness on a finer and finer scale. And so you can never find a point on this line where it's actually just straight and you know where it's going next. Um, and so that's what it means to be non-differentiable. And that's uh, what Notal is saying in his theory of space-time. He's saying that we may see particle trajectories that look like they're just going, you know, in a normal line, but if you zoom in on that line, it's a very jagged path that it's taking, which comes in, you know, gives us our uh, unpredictability in quantum mechanics or our uh, predictability only by probabilities. Okay, so another quality of fractals, some fractals, not all fractals, is self-similarity. And so that's, hey Laura, um, and so that is when you have one pattern and then that pattern is repeating at every level of scale. And so this is called the Koch curve. And it starts out like you can imagine um, this as a part, well, the, the entire Koch snowflake starts out as a star of David. And then each of those little triangles becomes a new star of David. And each of those little triangles becomes a new star of David. And so that's kind of the same thing here. So you start with a straight line, you take out the middle third, and you insert a little triangle, right? And then you take that original pattern and do the same thing to each of these line segments. You're taking out the middle third. Um, and so that is actually how the fractal dimension is defined. You're dividing by three, this thing piece by three, and you're also shrinking it by a third. So it's the scaling factor. It's the shrinking by a third that's giving us this number right here, which is S, your scaling factor. So this is defining the fractal dimension. Um, and we're also multiplying by four. So we took the third out, and we're left with a third here, and a third here, a third here, and then this is our fourth third. So we now have four thirds is the length of this line instead of three thirds when it was just a straight line. Um, and so this defines the fractal dimension. The logarithm uh, makes an exponential growth linear. And so that's what these guys are doing in here. It's getting smaller and smaller. Well, the line is getting longer. Because for each one of these things, it's no longer a straight line. You're going like that, right? And so if you're measuring with a smaller measuring device, this line is going to measure longer than that one. You're adding uh, depth to it. You're adding complexity to it. Okay, so the logarithm in this equation, because fractal dimension just equals the log of the number of iterations is what this n is, and that's when you're multiplying by four. One, two, three, four segments. And the log is o divided by the log of the scaling factor, which is how much it's getting compressed. Um, and so the logarithm is just saying when you take a log of zero, you get the exponent if it's base 10. And so it's taking a linear progression, sorry, this is supposed to not be even. It's supposed to be even. Um, no, it's supposed to be out of order. Okay, go that one. <laughs> Anyhow, it's taking the linear progression and relating it to the exponential progression. So the exponents go in a linear fashion, one, two, three, four. But for every exponential step, there's a logarithmic step, or an exponential step, excuse me, over here. And so the logarithms go one, two, three, and um, these numbers go exponentially here. Okay. 